cut it short. Fortunately, um, <clears throat> very unfair to make me follow Hugo, I have to say. Um, uh, my background with all this kind of stuff is that I'm not a computer scientist. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> um, let's talk about cigars. Um, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I, sorry? You should be able to set key on Oh, look at that. Except the, uh, it's, well, they're missing half of it. Oh, the chopping. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Let me, um, play around with the settings while we talk. We'll live with that, doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, about 15 years ago, I read uh, Damien Broderick's book, The Spike. I was working in the IT industry at the time and uh, you know, became fascinated with this stuff. Uh, met with Damien and we, we chatted about where all this stuff was going. And then when I, um, uh, would, as I mentioned earlier on, whenever I talked to people about this stuff, they looked at me like I was uh, completely loony. And so when I uh, left my IT career at Microsoft in 2004, I started uh, an online media company called the Podcast Network and sort of had a specific purpose to try and build media to talk about this kind of stuff with people, to talk about the big issues. And this is what I see as one of the big issues uh, facing the human race. Uh, there are others, including climate change, including the geopolitical spectrum, but this is one of those issues. Um, now, over the course of the last uh, 10 years, if we look at the Google Trends map uh, to see how much increased discussion, I mean, Hugo said that this is now mainstream stuff in the US, but if we go by Google Trends, the amount of traffic on Singularity hasn't really grown in the last six or seven years. That spike, I suspect, is a PS free game that came out called Singularity a couple of months ago has nothing to do with what we're talking about here today. So there, there still isn't as much discussion going on out there as we would hope uh, in the general public sense about what does all this kind of stuff mean. And you know when I first met Damien Broderick 15 uh, odd years ago and said when are people going to start to pay attention to this stuff, he uh, said when it's way too late. And so what I've been trying to do is figure out what do we do about that? How do we get more discussion going? And over the last four or five years, I've done interviews with a lot of the names that have been mentioned here today, Kurzweil, Ben Goetzel, Rodney Brooks, uh, Eliezer, Budowski, etc. about these sorts of issues. What, where is it going? What do we do? Now, as I said before, I'm not a computer scientist. Um, I don't have a 200 IQ. I can't get in and do the nuts and bolts research. Now, now, perhaps some of you are in that camp, perhaps some of you are in the same camp as me. What I figured I could do was talk, create discussion, create debate, build awareness, try and get people thinking about these issues, discussing what do we want. Do we want to push forward with this stuff? Uh, what are the risks? What are the benefits, etc.? So I guess the theme of my discussion today is uh, how do we create more discussion, more debate, more engagement? And, and with that in mind, how about a round of applause for Mr. Ford here for pulling this together. The first one outside of the United States of America. So I mentioned briefly, and you know, I feel like anything, everything I've got to cover in my talk has kind of been preempted by the panels that we've had today and the other speakers, so I'll rush through it. But as I said in the last session, what is our goal? Um, is it really about the survival of humanity? I'm not really sure that we're worth surviving. Um, we, we are, I believe, unfortunately, uh, fundamentally uh, flawed, uh, incapacitated due to, as I said before, the, the limbic system that we inherited from our reptilian ancestors, let alone our primate ancestors. Um, we, we just, uh, I mean, it was interesting listening to Rob talk in that last panel. 
as a, as a secular humanist, I would love to think that uh, we could uh, uh, take control and as a, as a you know, a Marxist, I'd love to see the, the proletariat rise up. I just don't think we've got enough time. Uh, I think six degree temperature rises, I think 20,000 active nuclear warheads uh, with a bunch of religious zealots with their fingers on the trigger. I think with the corporate hegemony that we have around the world today, I just don't see that we've got a window of opportunity that's big enough for us to get our shit sorted out, quite frankly. Um, I am quite pessimistic, as Adam said to me before, you should sit on this panel with Hugo because you're an optimist. Really? <laughs> shit, it's not often that people refer to me as I loon is what they usually refer to me as. I just don't, I don't feel good about the fact that we, we have enough time left. I really don't. If, if I have to place my bets with where our best opportunity is to uh, survive as an intelligent species in the next century, it's advanced uh, 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 you know, forms of, of silicon-based uh, digital artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it. It's moving through the singularity. I think that's our best chance of survival. And again, as I'm trying to make the point here, we probably won't survive as humans if we go through this. I'm, I'm more concerned about the survival of intelligence in uh, you know, advanced intelligence in whatever form it takes. Now, I'm saying this as a father of two beautiful 10-year-old boys who I love dearly. I really don't think that by 2050 they will be recognisably human. Um, I, I'm hoping I won't be recognisably human by 2050 for that matter. Um, I, I just really think that this is the best chance of survival of intelligence on this planet. And as I said earlier on the panel, yeah, look, I would like to think that if we wipe ourselves out on this planet that there are intelligent beings on other planets in other galaxies so it doesn't matter but that's uh, a great deal of speculation and again as uh, although i agree with rob and we can't really talk about evolution or natural selection as moving towards anything when i when, i remember when i first met damien broderick he said well who cares if we wipe ourselves out you know matter can neither be created nor destroyed what does it matter you know there is what does what the matter matter there were, there were atoms now, there'll be atoms then. And I thought, well, you know, I had a series of sleepless nights over that. What I do care about if I have to pick something, because I tend to agree with him, I mean, it's all just atoms. A lot of friends who, when they get into these discussions with me, say, well, Cameron doesn't even think we exist anyway, just thinks it's a bunch of atoms. And I'm like, well, you're actually you're right. I mean, it's, um, but if I do have to care about something, it's about uh, the survival of intelligence. And I'm concerned that if we don't go through the singularity, we won't get there. Um, I, I, you know, as opposed to Hugo's slides, mine are just a couple of pictures, really. I'm a pictures kind of guy. Um, the, the, the big issue that I see uh, that we're facing is th this basic thesis, this basic premise that I have that when the, again, as a Marxist, when the bourgeoisie, when the wealthy elite start to pay attention to actually what's going on here, they're not going to be happy about it. And that they will try and shut it down, co-opt it, subvert it, uh, whatever. And maybe for, for, for very valid reasons. But if for no other reason than all of the promises, the benefits of transhumanism and the singularity run counter to the perceived economic interests of the bourgeoisie, the wealthy elite. Um, again, uh, you know, I, I tend to agree with Marx that the history of the human race is the history of a class struggle. I have to take issue with Hugo. Is Hugo still in the room? Uh, uh, the million deaths in the early part of the 19th century were not as a result of the Napoleonic Wars. As, uh, as a member of the International Napoleonic Society, I have to say they were the wars of the coalition against the French. Um, <laughs> and I object to the term the Napoleonic Wars uh, quite dramatically. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the, the history is of the, the wealthy elite trying to, you know, reasonably so, uh, maintain and increase their wealth and their security and their privilege. That's if I was a member of the wealthy elite, I'm sure I'd want to do the same thing. I see the singularity and these, these technologies that we're talking about as, you know, the greatest opportunity that the, the people, the proletariat have ever had to finally wrest control away from the landlords, the wealthy elite, 
the, uh, the dukes, the kings, the corporate CEOs, the congressmen that have been running uh, things since the get-go. But if we let them have their way, uh, this isn't going to go smoothly and um, I think you know, we need to be prepared to put up a struggle. Um, Mr. Schopenhauer famously had the three stages of truth. I, I like to refer to the three stages of disruptive technology having been around the internet business since uh, the early 90s. Um, you know, first it's ridiculed. Uh, and that is obviously, you know, if anyone pays any attention to this stuff today, it's usually ridiculed, <coughs> including by our esteemed colleague Rob. Um, secondly, it's, it's violently opposed. And then um, Schopenhauer said, thirdly, it's accepted as self-evident. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have found with disruptive technology is that uh, thirdly it tends to get co-opted and subverted by the wealthy elite. This is the uh, point in the plan where we need to fight against it. Just as an example, um, this is a 1990, you're probably not going to see because my slides aren't working. Um, you know, the corporate media, when the uh, World Wide Web first started to raise its head in the, the mid-90s and gained some popular recognition, mostly laughed at it. I was in the industry at the time, I was working for I was a web developer in 94 and then was working for Aussie Mail from 96 to 98 when I joined Microsoft. Um, it was referred to as a fad, it was referred to as the, you know, pet rocks of the 90s. Um, you know, this guy uh, famously wrote, uh, the truth is, there's a typo in his article, no online database will replace your daily newspaper. I think there's a lot of daily newspapers out there that wish that continued to be true. We've seen one collapse about every month for the last 18 months. He also wrote later on, how come my local mall does more business in an afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? Even if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism, salespeople. <laughs> now this is just one of, uh, you know, countless hundreds of articles in the, in the corporate media 15 years ago, just you know, ridiculing the internet. Unfortunately, I couldn't find many more of them. Surprisingly, they're not online. Uh, I wish I'd kept the newspapers and the magazines that I bought at the time. You know, so uh, if you, I don't know how many, I mean, most of you are probably younger than me, but uh, uh, for those who, that have been around uh, as long as I have, I mean, as I said, the internet was kind of ridiculed in the mid-90s, uh, that it would ever be anything more than a, a fad. Then it started, when it started to gain a lot more traction, uh, it, it, you know, they started to talk about the dangers and the fears of it. Oh, people will be downloading bombs, or recipes for bombs anyway. And, oh, there'll be pornography and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then around about 98, as I mentioned in the panel earlier on, it started to get co-opted. Basically, a lot of money came out of the woodwork and all of these internet entrepreneurs that had grand schemes and grand visions of the democratization of media or the democratization of retail and how we were going to overthrow Woolworths and Coles and everyone would buy everything online and you'd have all of this massive choice, etc. that would drive prices down, increase service levels, basically got co-opted because, you know, uh, Coles and Woolworths and the Packers and a bunch of very wealthy individuals in this country went along to these uh, entrepreneurs and said, here's 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars, come, come with us and everything will be well. And they did, and those businesses, most of which, uh, the D-stores, uh, the wish lists, if you remember back in the heyday of e-commerce, in this country aren't around anymore, at least not in any recognisable form. Most of them either got uh, uh, acquired through M&A processes by the big retailers and then were shut down, like, uh, what was the one that Woolworths bought? It was a greengrocer.com.au, I think. Or they basically just went out of business. And they got shut down. So, um, and then, of course, here we are in 2010. They're still being opposed, particularly by Mr. Conroy, by the net neutrality guys. There's a whole bunch of work being done trying to shut down the internet. Why? Because I believe it's seen as a, a threat to the powerful, wealthy elite. You know, again, those of you that are old enough to remember in the late 90s, everyone was talking, oh, oh, you know, the big media companies, the software companies, I worked for one, the telcos at the time were saying, oh, one day everyone will have this digital media device they'll walk around with and it'll speak to the internet and the cloud and 
you'll be able to walk down the street and we'll pop up messages telling you about what wonderful things you can buy from the shop just around the corner. Now we have those things today, they were actually right, They're, they've come to fruition, but they don't like it anymore because it's, it's not actually driving the, the economic benefit they thought it was. Now people are doing stuff like WikiLeaks, they're, they're talking about stuff that they don't want them to talk, they're actually talking about how good and bad products are and it's, it's uh, backfiring on the big corporations that thought they would own it. And as soon as they saw it was actually going to be a tool that the people could use, they've tried to hamstring it via internet filters, via net neutrality, via co-opting and subversion. So my theory is that, well yeah, but WikiLeaks gives us hope. So. Um, but my theory is that these are the same sorts of behaviours we should expect to see in the singularity technology space uh, if it, uh, as soon as they start to take it seriously. Um, of course, in um, the Clue Train Manifesto, my friend Doc Searles wrote, hyperlinks subvert hierarchies, and I tend to think he was right. This is, this is our way forward. We need to uh, go and educate what Margaret Mead referred, referred to as the small groups. And we do that through social media, through digital media, through online technologies. The, the, the corporate media is going to continue, I mean, despite Hugo being on the History Channel, which is a wonderful thing talking about this stuff, and you get the occasional positive article in a new scientist or something like that. Generally, I mean, generally speaking, don't expect to see Melon Koshy talking positively about the singularity or a 60 Minutes show that reaches you know, the, the masses or Master Chef talking about recipe, how to play the recipe for the singularity. Anytime soon, the corporate media is going to basically be uh, ridicule, ignoring and then ridiculing and then violently opposing this stuff. If we want to see it happen, and I accept that not all of you do, but if we want to see it happen, we need to get out there and educate the, the, the small groups of people, like the ones that are in this room today and the, the people that we can reach, about really what's going on here, what's at stake, what it means, what the benefits and what the risks are. And we need, to, we need to drive this grassroots singularity awareness. Now, as I said before, I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm not a computer scientist. I can't get involved in doing the, 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 the code. But what I can do is talk to people. I can talk to friends, I can do interviews, I can try and reach hundreds or thousands or ten thousands or hundreds of thousands of people with a message of awareness about what work Hugo's doing, what Ben Gertzel is doing, what, what Ray's talking about. Uh, just to try and make people aware this is pretty much all we can do. Now, for every PZ out there who likes to uh, take the piss out of Ray and the singularity, you know, there are 10 boing boings um, that, that, that want to talk positively about this stuff. And we can participate in these forums and get out there and get actively involved in the community movement. Um, George, I was tweeting to George before saying that I was going to mention his stuff today. There's a lot of podcasts out there. The Hive guys that are in the room today. There's a lot. What just happened there? Yeah, good work, guys. Oh, Conroy! <laughs> there you go. We're, we're, we're back. Um, there's a lot of great podcasts, is my point out there, that you can get involved in and promoting and or participating in if you're somebody who should be interviewed or, or, or a member of those. There's a lot of great Facebook groups talking about the singularity. Get involved, promote them, join them, uh, participate in discussions if you're not already. Um, of course, I jumped on Twitter yesterday. Yes, that's my Twitter page. But Chuck Norris is the background. Um, <clears throat> that's what we should be really scared about. It's not Artelex, it's Chuck Norris pissing him off. <laughs> I tell you, the Artelex are scared of Chuck Norris. Um, <laughs> Maybe Chuck Norris is made of nanotech artists. That would explain a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion going on on Twitter, but nowhere near enough. Again, you know, as I said, I've referred jokingly a couple of times in the panels. Whenever I get involved in discussions with people about this kind of stuff, they look at me like a crazy person. Um, you know, we need more discussion, more debate, uh, more people. I mean, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have believed I'd ever stand in a room with 50 people that were, you know, uh, talking about this stuff. I, when I tweeted when Hugo mentioned um, the, the, the Drake equation and uh, Fermi's paradox. It's the first time in my life I've ever been in a room where somebody else was mentioning that. And it's not me bringing it up. I was like, oh my God, what's happening? Um, you know, we, we need more discussion on Twitter. We need, I, need, I need to see more people talking about this stuff. I mean, I need more people out on YouTube doing videos about 
these sorts of things and what they need. Every one of you, whether you're a computer scientist or not, can get involved in creating media, uh, taking some personal responsibility about sharing what you know from the books you've read, from the, the talks you've listened to. You can all play a very significant and dramatic role in uh, educating people, building awareness about what's going on. So get involved, but look, a final point. Don't be geeks. Don't be nerds. Make it accessible if you're going to do this stuff. I mean, okay, look, there's a, several, uh, there's a certain level of nerdity that has to be uh, engaged in to talk about this stuff, but if we want to reach the general population, we need to put it into terms that they can understand. And I struggle with this all the time, as obviously people look at me like I'm crazy. But we, we need to figure out how to articulate this stuff. Now again, this is where I see a lot of us can actually play a significant role because, you know, quite frankly, the numbers guys like Hugo or like Eliezer aren't really the people who are probably going to be able to reach uh, the mums and dads and the mainstream audiences because their IQs are, are too far apart. It's hard for them to, I mean, you know, we can all sit in the room and just, you know, listen to Hugo for hours, but the mums and dads are going to struggle with a lot of this stuff. We, we need to find ways to make it accessible when we get out there. I think that's the, going to be a big challenge for us. How do we get the issues out? Uh, that's it. I'm done. I'm jumping on a plane. Uh, feel free to tweet me or email me. Uh, if you want to hear any of the interviews that I've done with, with Kurt Swall and these guys over the years, just Google. My old show used to be called G'day World, not Gay World. Um, <laughs> it's another show. Um, just Google G'day World. Not that there's anything wrong with that. G'day World and Singularity. Uh, you'll see a list of these interviews that I've done over the years. Uh, but again, uh, great to see you all here. It's very exciting. And uh, big congrats to Adam. And for everyone for coming along, taking a day or two out of your life. Cheers. And, and maybe they do it, maybe they don't. Um, my, my general concern is that if we don't have a grassroots support movement for this when it happens, if, it, if and when it happens, we will see the, the powerful elite that have their finger on the trigger these days try and shut it down because it runs contrary to what they perceive to be in their best interest. You know, I was talking to Hugo before during one of the breaks, and I said, you know, if, there, if a war does break out over all this sort of stuff, it'll, you know, I feel that it will be the humans that start it. It'll be the people that are concerned about what it means to them or their interests that start it. And, you know, if you believe like I do, and, and, and I accept it, you may not, but if you believe like I do that this is our best chance of getting through the next century, we need to be tilling the soil. We need to make sure that... It, when, the, when the elite come to try and shut it all down, there's enough of, a, of an uprising to, to prevent that from happening. I just feel that if uh, we don't have the general public educated about this stuff early enough, that when the elite try and shut it down, nobody will bat an eyelid and it'll be over. Sure, perhaps, that by letting the general public so know, you won't create the groundswell of negativity in Well, no, because again, as I said in the first panel today, I. Just, I, I cannot believe that most people don't want the benefits that we're talking about. The end of humanity, which is what we're talking about. Well, that's, that's a, seriously, well, that's one way of looking at it, but the other way of looking at it is you cease to become human and you become transhuman. You become, you never get sick. Nobody who you love ever dies. There's no more cancer. There's no more nuclear war. There's no more climate change. There's a positive spin and a negative spin to that. Now, the positive spin, and, and, you know, I, I genuinely believe the negative spin that, look, we're not going to survive this century without this. We're going to, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you read Chomsky, but, you know, Chomsky believes that we are closer now to all-out thermonuclear destruction than we've ever been, including 1962. I mean, it, there's just a lot more of it out there and a lot more crazies with the potential. You know, 1962, we had, you know, Russia and Kennedy, Khrushchev and Kennedy with their finger on the button and Castro in the middle. Today, we've got God knows how many. We've got Israel, we've got India, we've got, you know, potentially Ahmadinejad, we've got Obama and the crazies there. We, I mean, you know, I don't, like, I don't like the looks of it. You know? 
Uh, uh, sorry, yes, sir, up the back, I think you're doing it. Yeah, look, I, I can see that as a potential scenario. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I, you know, this is pure speculation. I tend to hope that if the technology for, let's say, a nanofabricator gets out there, they'll have as much success controlling that as the RIAA has controlling copyright of music. Um, it'll just get out there, and um, one, it only takes one person to release, you know, a self-replicating nanofabricator, and it's all over. So, I mean, I, I don't think controlling it is necessarily going to be uh, practical. Yes, sir. I'd like to offer a $1,000 wager. If anyone in this room that's uh, the CEO or So yeah, so so I'll back to you next. Uh, sir, no, right. So you're obviously very fond of WikiLeaks. What are your thoughts on the latest debate about all information to be available versus uh, as long as the post is out there in the morning? Um I I you know, I don't know. I mean I I think uh, A you know WikiLeaks does a pretty good job of deciding what they get to put out there and what they're not. B, I think even if I had plans for a nuclear device, I probably wouldn't be able to get the uranium 235 to build one. There's a 238, 238 to build one, or the uranium 235 to do whatever I wanted to do with that. Uh, and I figure the people who probably want to get those plans probably have them already. So I don't know. I mean, I'm all for uh, transparency, uh, access for information. Uh, you know, I don't think that everything should be available. You know, there are probably Theoretically, ethically, some things that I don't want out there, but I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly what those things would be. Um, uh, gee, everybody, yes, sir. Uh, well, the Afro. Uh, like <laughs> Diaspora. 
Right, yeah. Is that out yet? I think that needs to Right, right. Um, yeah, look, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, there's pros and cons of that. I mean, it's the same thing people say, well, as somebody who's a self-professed narco-syndicalist or Marxist, why do you run seven businesses? Um, <laughs> because I live in a capitalist society and I use what I have to get the job done, you know. Um, these are the tools that we have to reach people today. Yes, they're owned by mega corporations, but they're the tools that we have to reach people. So until diaspora is available, let's use the tools that we have and hopefully the pros outweigh the cons in that. Well, you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll paraphrase Michael Moore. Anyone seen the film The Corporation? The film of it? Last scene, uh, Michael Moore, for those of you who remember it, says, you know, I used to wonder, I always talk about the evils of corporations, and yet it's big corporations that finance and distribute my films, and I used to wonder, why do they do this if I'm actually going out there and telling people that they're bad? He said, I realise it's because they don't believe anyone's going to listen to me and they don't really care. And it's one of the flaws, fundamental flaws of capitalism. They don't really care what they do as long as there's money in it. Even when the behaviour that they're investing is, it is about decrying the evils of, of corporatism. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I well, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, he's, he finishes that movie by saying, but I know that there's at least one person out there who's going to hear what I say and do something about it. I saw that movie and the next day I started the podcast network and quit my job at Microsoft. So it, it worked for me. And I just hope that, that, you know, by getting out there and rattling people's cages that I can change the way that one person thinks. And that one person might be a Julian Assange. It might be somebody who's way smarter, has way more skills than I do. But you can only do what you can do. You know, all, I mean, all you can do is use what you've got. Yes. <laughs> Thought maybe dot com. There's a whole bunch of documentaries about the menu users. Thought maybe dot com. If anybody wants to do any advertising, there's a website you can post. You have to pay Adam. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes, Mr. High Forty Five. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering um, what arguments have you found of statements that have is effective at getting across like the similarity of ideas and stuff? None whatsoever. Yeah, I failed every time. <laughs> Uh, actually, no, that's not true. Uh, you know, what I've found is people with a sufficient level of intelligence <laughs> um, tend to just get it. Let me ask you another question, just out of interest because I'm in this room. How many people here believe in free will? 50%? Uh, the ability to create thoughts outside of the laws of cause and effect. <laughs> A lot less. That's the same conversation for me. When I try, for 20 years I haven't believed in free will. I say the thoughts are properties of the brain, brain is made of chemicals, chemicals are made of laws of chemistry, therefore it's necessary to free will. Now, I've had that conversation with a gazillion trillion people in the last 20 years. 99.9% .9 of them just refuse to accept it. 0.1% go, oh yeah, all right, I don't believe in free will. I find it's the same thing with all this kind of stuff too. You know, there's, there's a percentage of people that just will follow through the logic and, you know, will, will agree with it. Um, a lot of people will follow, th intelligent people will follow through with the logic and not agree with it, like Rob, for example, just doesn't think that it makes sense. But, and, and that's fine with me too, it's the people that just don't want to go there and don't want to talk about it or just get this gut reaction to it that they don't want to deal with that um, I, I struggle with. How we, how we connect with those is part of my ongoing sort of struggle. Same as trying to talk people out of being Christian. <laughs> which I spend just as much time doing. Uh, so, is there any more questions? Thank you. Oh, we're done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Ben Ewan, and his has uh, been Eaton's final year of his PhD um, on AI, and uh, he's developing AIs which depend on an environment that um, 